Um, so today, um, if I may, uh, in a brief presentation yesterday, I was saying I like to call the uh, sort of sewer system of Solaris. It's what you don't want to hear from. Uh, it's generally when things are broken. So you might say it's not a uh, particularly um, grandiose place to work um, in the sense that people don't want to hear from you. Um, but if something when things do go wrong, and um, as Jeff or Bill said just now, we try to build on that assumption that things are going to go wrong um, from time to time, you need to know there's some, something decent underneath there, something structured to catch it all. Now, uh, the, the fault management uh, architecture from Sun has been around since Solaris 10 um, first customer shipment, um, so quite a few years now. And uh, I'm not going to be talking about that um, as such today. I'll, I'll, cover it very briefly. Um, it's been around a while, you may or may not have encountered it depending on uh, what's broken on your system and importantly whether it may have coverage of that. So, so more recently that we've had say disk coverage, but we've had CPU and memory and then PCI and so on coverage for, for a long time. Um, so you generally tend not to hear from us uh, unless, unless hardware is broken at the moment. Um, there's other reasons for not hearing from us. I think we're a bit too anonymous in some ways in, in, in the the way in which we complain when something is broken, so it's, it's not been unknown that people have had problems uh, and only really discovered it uh, well after the event, which is what we've done. We've done our job well, but we haven't really announced it that well. Uh, so I'm going to be talking today mostly about um, some pretty easy technology, really, of taking what we've done on um, fault management architecture, which is a generic architecture, but today um, almost entirely biased towards hardware. Uh, and look at um, moving that out into, into the software arena to see what we can do there. And for that horrible saying, picking off some learning and fruit. Um, so, this isn't a very well stated problem description, but uh, essentially, Solaris has worked. Well, Solaris has uh, a good number of very decent debugging technologies, but by and large, they're all very much biased towards uh, the development cycle. So when you're, when you're able to insert additional code or you have the original de developers present and you have to understand the code and so on. Um, and if you're looking at post-mortem stuff uh, where you've got a kernel crash or something, you kind of get a snapshot in time and not a whole lot of context around that that you can build up a little bit. It really is a, a tiny fraction. Um, and I, I suffered under that load for, for many years. Um, I worked in service for three or four years. And it's absolutely miserable. That was my job doing crash down analysis. And you know, you've, got, you've done anything of what the machine did for the last 200 days it was up, and then suddenly it died. And we don't, uh, despite all these um, technologies like MDB and DTrace and so on, we don't actually give developers of, uh, in Solaris any real debug infrastructure uh, to rely upon. So people brew their own. And uh, those tend to have uh, one of just two or three different. Uh, Outcomes generally uh, quite often they get deleted before the final push back to Solaris because they've, they've brewed something that's good enough for development, but it's not something you can be proud enough to put back into the source base. Um, so so that they hack it out or they, they um, hide it in if they've debug type um, code, uh, those sorts of things. And generally, it tends to disappear, um, or it, or it's something that's only enabled when you when you want it. So you need to go and set some flag in the system or something to collect additional information. And surprisingly, you know, that, that stuff's not enabled at the time the customer first experiences the problem. So, you know, we've also got this idea of trying to debug things on first failure. That, that, that doesn't, doesn't help. Um, so, I want to look at um, ways of, um, of improving that situation. And, and as a reference point, if you've never looked at it uh, in Windows, the, the system event log, well, not system event log, the, the Windows event log, uh, is actually pretty damn good. They, they, they sync a whole bunch of events from all over uh, Windows uh, to the event log. It's structured. It, uh, you can subscribe to it, and you can do stuff with that, um, with that structured stream that you've that you, uh, subscribed to in the way of diagnosing it or messaging it and all those sorts of things. And you'll see in a minute, uh, FMA is not at all dissimilar to that, or maybe they're not too dissimilar to FMA to become first. But, um, you know, the fact that we don't push that a bit further and continue to do the software uh, is what we're applying. Please, I should say, just stop me as you, as you wish for any questions. Uh, so I don't really need to uh, elaborate on the so what. Um, it, it essentially means what debug we get is uh, haphazard. It's customized per subsystem. And you very frequently need to 
down deep into the source or speak to the developer, that's how system will work out how to switch it on, how to download and all that, that sort of stuff. Um, when it comes to post-mortem debugging, it's, it's a nightmare. Um, it's also, uh, and this is from a vendor point of view, you can't answer simple questions like uh, trend analysis, you know, what, what is failing, how frequently, what, uh, what's hurting the customers, and you, you tend only to hear about it when a customer uh, in some technology uh, escalates it through our uh, sustaining organization. It's, it's something that's currently hurting them and they want it fixed, and you don't know about it in advance. Um, and that's because we've just got these haphazard, you know, printed type uh, error messaging here and there with no structure to them. Um, also, we want to um, go on to do some more phone home type stuff for, um, for software based things and hardware as we have today. Um, but again, if you've got hap haphazard messaging, uh, yeah, it doesn't help there. And as I say, we've been here before with, with hardware. Um, that came out of a, very, of a very specific need at the time. We had the Ultraspark 2 eCache disaster. Uh, lots of errors, nobody saw it coming because we just had haphazard error messaging and that messaging was incomplete, often led to re replacing the wrong CPU and so on. Um, there were about three people in the world who understood it at the time. And um, so out of that came uh, the, well, a few efforts culminating in the, um, the full fault, ma fault management architecture, um, which I believe I have a picture of. Um, so this is a, a non-consistent example, but it's supposed to illustrate kind of what happened in the past. That you've got this whole stack of things that might observe an error or see some symptom of it. They all just blurt out some some observation of that error. One of them might actually be the important one that sort of took the hardware trap, and the rest are just sort of um, seeing propagations of the error as, they, as it propagates through the system. But nonetheless, they all just throw out some random interpretation of that error. Um, even if you did have the uh, hardware guides available to you, and most of them at the time were proprietary, um, you still couldn't decode their message frequently because half of it was missing. They put out one hardware register, then not the one you actually needed, and so on. So it was just, again, what was useful at the time, say that this was CPU stuff at the time, it was useful at the time that CPU was brought up in development and left in the code base, and then a different problem occurred, not surprisingly in production, when you had to really debug, you know, the appropriate uh, information wasn't there. And so instead we, we uh, constructed this uh, elaborate um, FMA uh, fault management architecture, um, which is um, it's designed to span the sun and scale beyond if, uh, if we, other people can, can would adopt it. Um, the first, uh, first part of FMA um, is the event protocol. Um, yeah, we need to have structured events, we need to have a structured name namespace by which to describe events. And uh, this elaborate diagram is supposed to show, show that uh, we have a few what I call category one uh, classes, the e-reports, upsets, faults, defects, and lists. Um, e-reports, loosely speaking, are, are for all hardware observations. Uh, faults are things that diagnosis engines put out, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, defects are um, is broken software, effectively. Um, and lists is a sort of more formal aspect of the protocol. That's, uh, that's what, uh, again, the diagnosis engine put out. Um, at every level, um, as you go down, you have, say, e-report, CPU, AMD, Northbridge, um, memory or something like that. Um, we write these uh, just by concatenating all those into a dot-separated, period-separated um, string. And at each level, you might define some standard uh, payload that, go, that is defined to be included at that level. So, uh, on the left, for an e-report, there's a, um, there's obviously a version, there's the class, um, there's a, a numeric um, association identifier, unique ID, um, there's a detector fMRI which tells you who's raising this event, um, and then as you go further down the tree, the events will add event-specific payload, um, for instance, hardware register detail, um, and other information. The, um, and then over on the right hand side you've got the sort of more formal side of the diagnosis we put out but still built in, in the, same, the same event protocol. Uh, the event protocol is far from huge, um, essentially that is it in some ways, it's just a, a tree with some defined payloads. Um, there's a bunch of requirements on the, uh, on the, on the protocol but it, it doesn't define um, how you need to implement it, it doesn't tell you how you need to marshal that data from detectors, how you should transport it and so on, that, that's left up to the the implementation because we do need to do this on both Solaris which is resource rich and things like service processes which are pretty constrained. 
So, so we leave that up to the implementation, as long as the two ends that are talking agree on what they're passing between them, um, and that this is uh, what's ultimately embedded. So as far as FMA, um, we could just diagram. Um, I'll talk through the event flow here. Um, in the top left, uh, we have uh, error observers of any type. Um, traditionally, these have mostly been hardware um, error observations, so for CPU memory, you track, read all registers, and spit out an observation. Uh, increasingly, now we have kind of software abstractions. We have SMF, the um, service management facility, we have ZFS, um, together with all the existing hardware things. That they pass it up what we call an e report and error report, fire it off towards the fault manager, um, firing it off as um, Posting it into an event channel that was kind of extended uh, to deliver these things. Um, the fault manager, it, its job is to um, kind of coordinate all the, all the subsystems. So it, it pulls in the error reports, it writes them to an error log synchronously so we can replay them if we use them. Um, diagnosis engines, the things in the bottom left corner, the orange ones, they can subscribe by, by event class. We've got this event naming um, hierarchy. They subscribe to the ones they're interested in, how you are able to interpret and apply diagnosis, diagnosis algorithms to. Um, they chew on it for a while, they might decide immediately that like an uncorrected memory error is probably obviously bad, and you can make a diagnosis straight away. Uh, otherwise, it may be some sort of soft error that might not be broken hardware if you only see one or two a month, but you know, if you see a hundred a day, it's not good. So, um, they apply various algorithms, some, some are clever, some are pretty dumb. Um, and uh, as they see fit, they'll put out a, a diagnosis. And uh, the diagnosis is a, well, the API uh, that the fault manager presents to the diagnosis modules for use. It, it's kind of modeled around the criminal justice system. So the idea is the, uh, we open up a case against the suspected fault and then we accumulate evidence and we attach the e-reports to the case. Eventually we might solve the case, which will put out a list of suspects. So you might have three or four suspected faults, or ideally just one uh, that you point to, along with um, requiring the protocol, you've got to point to the resource that you're inviting, uh, give the, the level of certainty, um, various things like that. So out of the diagnosis, engines flow, diagnoses, it goes back to the fault manager, which again caches it and logs it. Uh, the cache is there, so it's there at, re uh, at restart time, on the reboot, or when you restart the fault manager. Um, we remember what we diagnosed before. Um, and then it goes from there down to the uh, response and notifications on the agents, which I've drawn at the bottom of the night. Um, there you have, for instance, put the notification by SNMP uh, to the console to via the messages in the night. Um, we need to uh, uh, add in uh, additional notification mechanisms. Uh, embarrassingly, we don't even do email at the moment. Um, so, um, and that's why I say in the past it's been a bit anonymous at times. Uh, in addition to notification to tell you that there's a fresh diagnosis, we have uh, retire agents, which sorry, uh, response agents, which can take the indicted resource and say, let's do something about it to try and uh, isolate it in the system. So, for instance, a CPU may be offline. Um, the uh, an memory page that we know is bad will put it aside on, on a uh, retired V node and simply never use it again and remember that when we, when we reboot and so on. Um, so, so there's various actions you can do there. And then in the top right, we can exchange um, the protocol level information with other fault managers running elsewhere in other Solaris domains and other domains, uh, service processes and so on. The, the larger Sun systems run server process, ser service processes that are uh, capable of speaking with the FMA protocol or running the fault manager on their side. And they can share their observations because once you pull the two together, you can draw together and, and make a full diagnosis. So the question is really, can we um, readily leverage that infrastructure that's taken a few years to build out um, to do software-related things? And um, not just surprisingly, yeah. Um, there's plenty to leverage. Um, the FMA implementation, uh, if anything, is um, uh, over-designed. It's, it's, uh, it's very robust and pretty elaborate. Um, and, um, but it is a, a generic protocol, we need to extend it to cover you know, software observations rather than, than hardware, and hardware alone. Um, we have a lot of infrastructure built into Solaris, um, 
that uh, is designed to safely transport all these things um, to make sure we never lose it or try very hard not to lose any error observations to make sure we can save them over a panic and replay them on, on, on subsequent reboot, things like that. We have event channels that are designed to deliver the events in a um, two-phase commit um, scheme so that even if the user land demon should die, you can still get the events back when it restarts and so on. So there's been a lot of effort to make a very robust um, we have things like the LibMV Pair Library, which is uh, um, not the most pleasant thing to work with, but it's, um, it does a very good job of, of marshalling data in kind of name, type, and value tuples um, and uh, used throughout the, the FMA implementation. Um, and we use that essentially in building up our, our event, events that were the protocol events we construct. Um, the Fault Manager is kind of a mini operating system in its own right. It's, uh, Got many familiar constructs in it, um, and most of the variables are identifiers are similarly named. Um, but as part of that, it, it has a whole bunch of things that are useful in doing the uh, fault management, the logging, the diagnosis, persistence, and so on. Um, persistence meaning you checkpoint your diagnosis state, so when you restart and reboot, you pick up where you left off, you don't forget past history, and so on. Um, and it's our conduit to existing phone home technology and so on. So it's, so it's a very obvious thing to, um, to hook into to, um, to extend things. So what I want to do is to um, facilitate event publication uh, from pretty much any context, um, which is something we're used to doing in the kernel, that um, hardware error traps generally choose to strike exactly where you don't want them to. So you, um, you, can't hold, you can't hold mutexes or anything like that, you need to, um, uh, because if you lock the, the queue that you're going to put the observations onto, invariably when you're emptying it, you'll interrupt there again and then deadlock. Um, so with plenty of experience of doing that in the kernel, it's not too difficult to see how we can push that out, uh, out to userland. So whether we have a, a user application or, or system daemon, anything out in userland, uh, or, or kernel subsystems. We want them all to have a very um, simple to use and in fact even present uh, without denying it at times API um, that operates in pretty much any context. Um, it's basically too difficult to lay down a, a restricted context that is guaranteed to work in other ones because if the libraries you have linked with happen to want to use these interfaces too, it just gets too difficult to work out when, what, the, what the restricted context would be. So it's much easier just to try and aim for any context. Um, put, have them put out um, interesting observations that they care to make. Um, as I said at the beginning, the tradition was to remove that um, before put, put back. If we can make the API simple enough that it's there, it facilitates the debugging initially, and they can stay, um, stay in place for production as we choose the patterns on, um, then we get all those inserted at the you know, suitable points in the code. Um, so obviously you can't, you can't put those in your hottest code paths, um, regardless of how large weight it is, and you'll generate two, two zillion events a second. But you know, as you're writing the original code, you, you know what's supposed to be your, your error paths, not all that hot. You can set these sort of calls there. And if the infrastructure also throttles that event production so that if your error path somehow becomes your hot path, um, it still doesn't allow us to you know, send the system wild with, with millions of events. Um, so the idea is that at, at the call site in your code, you put minimum effort into raising an event, and I'll show you an example um, just now. Uh, that raises kind of a raw event which gets posted on the event channels and um, consumed by what I'm calling a protocol event factory. Uh, effectively, that just takes the raw event, which um, also selects a, what I call a rule set that's specific to that subsystem, and the, the event factory takes the raw information and the rule set, which effectively says how to interpret the raw, raw information, and constructs a, a protocol event, it gives it a full class, tidies up its payload, makes it user-friendly, so that if people are browsing it, they can read it rather than have to um, interpret you know, enumeration constants and so on. Um, and then post that into the fault manager in order for it to be chewed on, uh, diagnosis algorithms applied, uh, and even if it's something that's not inherently um, ind indicative of a fault, to allow it to be uh, notified anyway. So we've had a request for SMF. Customers want to be notified whenever a service is disabled. So it's not broken. Someone's actually chosen at the command line to disable it. But um, sometimes that's an error. And um, admin wants to be paged in that case. Um, 
traditional open label would have said that that's an uninteresting observation because it's not a fault, it's not been broken, you chose to do that. But we want to uh, facilitate uh, notification in those cases. So uh, I think I've kind of covered this already, but essentially event dispatch. Um, we need to make sure it works uh, regardless of your context. Uh, kernel user land, whether you're in a uh, signal handler, uh, interrupt handler, kernel, any of those things. You should be able to fire off an event uh, without any danger of, of, of deadlocking. So, the sort of things obviously you can't do are, are fire mutexes, or you have to do them very carefully. Um, you uh, also uh, can't go allocating memory, and you've got to be, um, you know, because it may want to call back into this library, or you might simply not have any, any memory to allocate, or it might be the amount of library that, um, that's raising the event. So, what we do is the same as we do with the kernel. We, we, if you've linked to this library, um, uh, at, at library initialization, uh, or when we initialize the API, as a call for that, um, we pre allocate a bunch of scratch buffers um, that take there. Uh, control over the size of those buffers and the number and all those sort of things, obviously. Um, and we create a, one or more um, and tunable um, publication threads. So the idea is that when you, uh, when you want to publish something from random context, you atomically unlink one of these structures off your free list. Um, you stick data in it, and some restrictions on the sort of data you can put in, I'll mention in a moment, and then you commit that, um, uh, that structure to a processing list, and you do no, no further processing there. So effectively, the operation is atomically unlinked, B copy, more or less, um, data into the deck to describe the raw event you want to raise, and, um, and then kind of give somebody a kick to go and process it. Uh, not using any synchronization primitives though. Um, and then separately, the, um, those asynchronous threads simply go and exit, uh, sorry, uh, empty those um, scratch buffers from the, from the processing list, and they can do the full, you know, uh, they can acquire mutexes and so on. And I think, because uh, I haven't actually written these part yet, I think they, um, they can still produce their own events because they're just going to bother onto those queues whether or not it's directly the ultimate um, consumer or not. So, I think the key to getting any adoption on this um, is two things. One, we need a simple API, and secondly, you need a no API for the common case. So I'll talk about that in a second. Um, I said there's restrictions on the type of data you can raise. Um, that's more or less a, kind of a mock-up. This is, we've done prototypes so far of how things could look. Um, this would be the simplest um, raw way of raising an event. You'd say something to do with publish an event, you give it a, a class and a subclass, um, just a, a string. Uh, those are interpreted relative to a rule set that you, uh, that you specify, and this interface just takes the default rule set, which will, will be kind of a, a free-form rule set for anybody to throw things at. Um, the, um, the class and subclass um, ultimately more or less determine the event protocol class, or they might be mapped to or expanded to the event protocol class in the factory module that I talked of. Um, you, you assign some, some sort of high priority, high or low priority. Um, there needs to be some more, rich, um, more richness there, in the sense that to automate some of these things where, if you want, say, your, your system management software to consume these raw events, without actually understanding them, but know when to pay, page somebody that needs to be rich enough to distinguish when a raw observation as opposed to a natural diagnosis, when a raw observation is important and probably, probably should require, you know, results in a paging. Um, so you need some of that there for the original event producer to say this is important versus not important. And also, we'd apply different throttling. So we'd, we'd, uh, the low, low priority events will not send over a separate channel I might have more of them, but be happy to drop them when you overflow. High priority events will try a lot harder uh, to deliver without the them. Yes. Kind of my question was that, like in some ways, just to be a hundred machines acting and doing the same thing, it's not a high priority event if one or two or five fail and you know, mutilation one up. But if you start to get to half of them are fail or you know, your last one, you only know, one left, then it's a high priority. Right. So, like, uh, is there some way to sort of escalate from low to high, or is it actually all good to well, at, at this level here, um, so if anyone can hear the, the question you're asking, um, you're asking if you have lots of places producing these sorts of failures, perhaps across multiple machines, 
Can you escalate it from low to high priority? How would you know that you've now got a critical mass fail or something? And I think the answer is there, that in your diagnosis software, it needs to subscribe to these events and then and keep a tag effectively of how many health fails. It would have to know the, know the resource pool of that you've got 100 resources and count how many of them fly and once your, once your capacity reduces below some level, we'll take some action. And yeah, that low is much higher priority and actually with how it tries to deliver the yeah, and, and it's also from the event producer's point of view, um, what it, how important it believes the event to be. And then at, at a higher level, you can aggregate that to um, you know, towards bigger decisions. But the idea here is that it's essentially from the developer's point of view to say, is this important or not? Um, is it something that might be useful in setting the context for debugging it afterwards, in which case it's probably low priority is to say, you know, I kick this off when I start a garbage collection or something. Uh, versus, you know, this is broken, or you know, one of my one of my variants is no longer invariant, or something like that. You know? So um, you might want to know about this. Um, the the tuples there that are listed in the, in the API are very much what our, our live MV pair looks like, in the sense that you've got a uh, a, a payload member name, uh, its type, um, and then one or more arguments to give the value for that type. If it's an array, you need to say how many members and then appoint it to the, to the first. Um, so, and then I, I've stuck on this uh, termination thing because whenever you've processed these var things before, you just leave, you leave one out and the whole thing generally passes okay. So um, <laughs> I think that's probably wrong. But you, you can defend against that a bit, for instance, if the data type enumerations, if you start them up at some foolish number that doesn't look like you know, any other data, you can kind of validate the layout there. Um, and of course, there's other way. I mean, there's uh, the mock-up of the API so far. You, you could get them to manually construct their own MV list um, using the MVP library and then submit it through this. Um, you know, this, is, this is supposed to be the most compact way. Um, our past APIs that have gone a little towards this sort of thing have required people to allocate a data structure or put one on their, on their stack, spend 10 lines filling it with stuff, post it off and be responsible for the posting and then free it and so on. And generally that makes your code expand vertically and just be unreadable and ugly. So my goal here was to keep it all kind of all the all within one core. Uh, the second example there is an example of a rule set selection. So I've got an RS publish for rule set publish. Um, you'd have some sort of um, selection between my vendor and subsystem to uniquely identify yourself. And then in the protocol factory that says select this rule set and the incoming raw event gets transformed there according to the rule set um, supplied or selected. Um, so one of our first uh, learning improvements that I said earlier is SMF. Uh, we want to record all service state transitions, um, be they to maintenance or simply from offline to online or online to disabled or whatever. Um, there you would use the, um, the SMF rule set which simply says um, in the post-processing, apply a set of rules that expects these format uh, events, but I don't need to do all the work at every call site here because that, that's not going to. What's going to need to know adoption if you have to do, do all the work uh, in every call site? So, and here I have a bunch of uh, handles which you might want to allocate if you know you're going to be routinely raising events rather than just an odd one here and there for your error path. So if you know you're doing all transitions and you're always going to post those off, you might want to allocate a handle and initialize it and associate some parameters with it there. Um, and then use an alternative uh, API member, p handle publish, publication handle publish. And again, now you just quote the handle and then the relevant raw data um, that you want to include and, and which your rule set implementation expects. So um, you might say service state transition for your class, I've got null for the subclass, um, number of pairs that follow and then the expected payload and then your your rule set implementation will take that and make it readable and pretty for, for notification agencies and subscription engines, diagnosis like engines. Um, I suspect I've covered this already. Um, but the key thing here is that uh, we need to, uh, particularly since um, SMF is one of, our, is one of our first targets to, to instrument, um, we need to be able to publish events and have them hang around until the eventual um, consumer turns up. And FMD is itself an SMF service, 
and as it happens, it starts pretty late on the boot because of some dark dependencies that they expect. But um, so you need to, the current um, general purpose event channel stuff in Solaris, which uh, is called general purpose but isn't because we withdrew the we, um, we withdrew the ARP case that, that allowed other people to use it um, based on security concerns and denial of service and so on. Um, that, some of that's going to have to be fixed before this can be made um, general purpose. Um, but they had this idea of being able to post an event and, and you, could, you can have a flag on the channel saying the event channel penned. And the idea was there that the, even if the subscriber hadn't turned up yet, which in my case is the protocol um, event factory, um, it would hang around until it did. It turns out that, that doesn't quite work as a, as a thought anyway. Um, if the original pr uh, producer exits or unbinds from the channel and nobody else has gone to it yet, it just destroys the whole channel. So some simple modifications there have us able to raise events from the beginning of boot, uh, well, as soon as your event channel system's online, which is very early in boot, and have them penned in the channels, um, pending um, FMD starting, beginning to cons consume from those. So we can get all the early boot, all the early user and startup events pretty easily. And as I said, our, our intended consumer is FMD, obviously, in Solaris, and it's able to, to do all the um, processing, logging, diagnosis, and notification, and so on. Um, the narrow missing there. Um, there's a, a new category one event uh, I'm suggesting I think, called SW event, or software event. Uh, e reports have been used for some software things, and particularly for ZFS and a couple of others. Um, kind of separating that to the kind of legacy now and saying e-reports should be for hardware. We use software events for all these observations. And so your, your protocol factory will take the raw events and construct a software event tree um, event. So you might have, for the, for the SMF example, it might be software event dot OS dot SMF service transition dot online. That's the new state you're transitioning to. Uh, and that's your, your name in your event that's generated and included with it a, a bunch of standard and standard payload. Um, no, I didn't mention, I can't remember it's on a later slide. Something we need to do here is commit part of our protocol um, in terms of stability levels uh, and, and name conventions. If we want people to be able to subscribe to service transition offline events, if that's what they want to be paged on, um, we're not going to have FMA produce a whole case diagnosis for that because that's just uh, well, it doesn't really scale on that in that sense. You're not expected to have power with faults in your system, you know, true faults. Um, if you just want to be notified when something goes to a particular state in an SNF, uh, you need to be able to subscribe with some mechanisms that were added to, to these event classes, software event, OS, SNF, service so transition to offline or something. You need to know that name is not going to change, and you need to know the payload content isn't going to change when in any two. So we're, we're going to have to commit to aspects of this tree uh, and aspects of the payload, as well as having a uh, black box recording side, which is simply throw all observations here. There's no guarantee they'll retain the same name within the payload. So event processing, left hand side, uh, pretty much as before. Uh, you generate events using the, the API, um, pretty simple. Uh, offload most of the um, grunt work into a write once uh, module to do the protocol event manufacturing based on the raw events. Um, push that into the event channels, which FMD um, subscribes to. Um, it does the diagnosis and logging and so on. We need to split off some different logs to do some um, circular logs uh, of, of low priority events at least. You, you don't want to retain those uh, forever, so you might want to set aside, say, a half gig circular logging keep the last time months of, of history there. Um, but all that's pretty much standard FMD functionality. Uh, on the right hand side, we have the event forwarding, which is, so I should probably just say, the, the diagnosis is standard there, but now you get to uh, subscribe to software events and apply the, the diagnosis algorithm you can see there. That would probably be the place to build out your capacity uh, decision, or if you want to do those outside the FMD API, um, which isn't committed yet. Um, you do it via the top right mechanism, which is a new thing where we're forwarding protocol events outside of FMD and allowing people to subscribe to them out there. And the, there's obviously a C API that allows you to subscribe to the, the protocol events. Uh, I've written some Perl bindings which let you 
subscribe to those events from a, a Perl script and uh, if I managed to understand it, a, a Python binding too. Um, and, and a few new notification mechanisms built out of that, that mechanism for um, a, finally, I think, a, a pop-up on your desktop which will tell you something's broken if you're there. Um, and an email and various other notification mechanisms. And th those would be your hook towards phone home for, for software. Um, and it doesn't have to be part of the FMD API. Um, we have, um, I'm not sure if anybody else here has had this as an RFV uh, for their use, but a number of customers, particularly the, tel the telco customers, want to hook into this telemetry, particularly the diagnoses, but they don't want to deliver FMD plugin modules because it's an uncommitted API. Um, but if we commit part of the protocol in terms of this dot suspect, which is the suspect list, um, and some of the reports and software events and so on, they can subscribe to them externally, possibly in Perl scripts or, or C applications, whatever they want, and do that sort of decision making externally too. And our um, Sun Ops Center, which is the grandiose um, thing to manage data centers, um, is planning modules to do these sorts of things where it will consume these events and decide you need to migrate to hosts off of this, um, or the guests off of some virtual machine um, to, to another host and so on, you know, when you hit capacity problems. Um, an unexciting protocol event that's supposed to be an SMF one raised from, from the early API call if you're transitioning to maintenance state. This actually isn't a very good example because the things like encodes the state from and state to as uh, numbers, which probably isn't a good idea because we're committing to disk and forevermore some enumeration that we may want to change. So we'll, have, we'll make those as, as, as strings, state from would be online, state to would be maintenance or something. Um, and then we'll commit those values to say you can depend on them being there for as long as the SMF is there and for as long as the event is sensible. Um, the detector over there, again, is a fledgling detector. It's, it's, it's not um, um, it's fully implemented yet. But as part of your of the implementation of that publish, if the publish thing, uh, it would grab uh, the location information of the call site. So that would take the process ID exactly, obviously, uh, but take the file function and uh, line number and so on, uh, and include all that. So you can go back from your observe stream back to who actually produced that event uh, through the E's. And that also needs to be a bit richer too. Um, so I'm going to work through a number of uses. I've got 10 minutes to go. So um, I've covered this one already. Service failure management. Uh, dead easy because the diagnosis that the, the service has failed isn't up to us. But you know, the maintenance state is decided by the, the restarter in SMF. And it just raises an event, and we say you might, you know, we'll raise a fault to echo that, and you can, you know, raise an SMP trash or anything, everything, phone home, that sort of find action. Uh, there's an external database going to be there which will record all your notification references, so you can say for this protocol event, blah blah blah, blah online, uh, you know, to, to offline, um, I want to be emailed to this email address, and, and all those configuration preferences are going to live. Uh, in SMF itself, so as long as FMS, SMF works a bit, we can get all that. Um, so there's, there's no clever diagnosis there, it's simply really just propagating events and making, making, them, um, making them more visible. Uh, we can get cleverer, we can add, like we have start exec, start, um, start exec and um, stop methods in your SMF manifests. We can add things like failure methods, so when something enters maintenance state, we can have it run a script that will go and you know, snapshot the data, uh, data sets perhaps, or go and grab the relevant logs or whatever, tie them up, um, put them all under some unique reference, which is going to be the reference that we use when we open a case in FMD, and when you do the phone home, we'll use that same reference, and you can automatically relay the data back to the vendor using that same reference to tie it all together. So there's a lot more we can do with this in the integration. Um, at the moment, SMF and FMA were conceived together, but I mean, just managed to meet in the middle. Um, so there's plenty more we can do to make SMF a lot more diagnosable and user friendly um, from a diagnosable point of view. Um, crash time management is the other um, first one we're doing in the, in the um, prototype at the moment. Again, obviously, there's no real diagnosis, um, it's crashed. Um, we just thought you might like to know about it. 
surprisingly, a lot of people don't know. Um, it was an Empress server that mostly gets nailed during the day. And it panics with a little nap. Very often people don't notice. And they, you know, when they do notice, they say, oh, look, there's another crash there from two months ago. Um, and um, but Pushworks already do this, but you, um, you know, if you have a panic, it will raise an event. Um, it will transmit the crash down uh, in, in, into some. Uh, we're, we're building a lab functionality and some automated analysis. So in response to the event that says there is a panic, uh, fresh panic written out, uh, we'll run some automated analysis tools that will summarize all the thread stacks and the panic stack and all those sorts of things. So when you raise your initial phone um, event, you can include at least the panic string and the panic stack, for instance, which is often a really good start. And you can then relay the, the crash information to, uh, into the vendor. Um, I don't think I have a slide on this, but the other one I want to do is um, call dumping, just when off call, when the call um, uh, initiates a call dump, just raise a little event to say who it was. And a simple frequency analysis on the back end uh, would be interesting. Um, black box recording was where I originally got interested in this and uh, kind of my motivation on the first slide. We dump a bunch of what I believe to be very useful debugging information, which you know, when you drive yourself into a corner in your code, you eventually get to the point where you say, ah, my debug mechanisms aren't rich enough to say that the debug went wrong or that unexpected things happen. So what I'll do here is just return now. Everyone up to the stack will just unwind, hopefully, not crash. And something will fail that you won't know anything about it and at least you won't panic. But um, it, the black box recording lets you get to those situations and, and simply say, instead of throwing up your hands in despair and returning now, you put out an event using what I think is a pretty simple API. Um, no requirement to, to deliver associated diagnosis rules and user lambda and things that will we'll provide some elementary frequency analysis and so on. Um, you simply fire out the event and when that data is all returned um, to your vendor, they can mine through it and look for, look for trends or things that should never happen this time. Um, or if you're doing a, a personal and debug, you've got to go through a bit of context. Um, CERT is an algorithm we, a very simple algorithm, just called soft, soft error rate of discrimination. It's just simply saying if something occurs at a, at a frequency of more than uh, more than n instances in, in a unit of time t, so more than three instances in 24 hours or something, then consider it a fault. Um, so all you need to do is keep a queue of, of the events, um, of the whole event, just their timestamp, age them up the back, and when you put a new one in, compare the, the two ends and say, has it gone over that, uh, that rate criteria more than n in time t? Um, that's used quite often in, in some of the simple diagnosis and the, in the hardware stuff. If you get like a, a level one cache error, you get more than n per day, you'll say that cache is obviously um, busted, um, that this tag is faulty. Um, we can do some similar stuff for, for software. You can say, uh, again, critically, don't make the API any more complex, but say, where um, where you normally get to the point of saying something's failed, so okay, I'll return null, but as an additional bonus, I'll go implement some counter which nobody else will set up. Um, so you, but you may be a case that counter, which is occasionally, occasionally looked at, and some, some tools will look for other values. <coughs> but we, we can define a type of case that or other types of counters, and when you increment them through what would be an API wrapper call, it increments the counter, it can be exposed in the usual way through case that. But in addition, when you, when you declare that counter, you say, here's my case stat, and here's an NT value, for instance, to say um, more than three a day is considered bad for this type of uh, error observation. Um, and here's the fault um, to diagnose when you, when you go above that rate. Right? So you'd say um, it's you know, fault of defect dot SMF dot whatever, to say um, this is the defect I want you to diagnose when, when you hit this, um, this condition. So the idea there is that instead of raising events, you simply bump the counter, but the implementation of that counter bump um, decides to raise and uh, uh, pushes it all up to, to user land, and FMD looks at the overall uh, aggregate rate and decides to raise a fault and point a finger at that call site um, when it's become too hot, but based on how you find it. Um, surprisingly, quite a few things fall out of the hands of us. For instance, the old um, spurious interrupt stuff we had at one stage, you could get seconds of spurious interrupts a second. Uh, now, I might delve into it. It's obviously something individual for this. If you're, if you're raising formal events, committed events, 
you plug it into your whatever triggers you have for your phone home software. Now challenges, um, obviously there's a few um, simple implementation challenges. The biggest one is simply not being more of a problem than the errors you're observing. So it's very easy to do that with discovery in hardware. Uh, if you report every corrected error and then you get a whole SD RAM fails, then you get infinite correctable errors and then you spin every CPU in the system to diagnose them. Um, so that, that, that's the situation you, you can get to very easily when your error path becomes your hot path. So you need automated um, throttling and sensible throttling separating the streams of low, low, and, um, low and high value telemetry and kernel versus user land and user land privileged versus just uh, unprivileged user. Uh, obviously security questions, uh, for instance, pushing all this stuff onto a shared channel, uh, who else can bind to that channel and see it? That's a privileged application and an unprivileged one. And, uh, possibly the trusted extensions guys might get excited about that. Um, but critically adoption, and the key thing is, I think the proposed API though, um, obviously it works in the prototype obviously easily enough. Uh, it's easy to use, and you've got to, you've got to get some mindset for people to begin to adopt it. I think you also need to uh, rewrite some common APIs, such as common error, um, the ERR3C functions, the ERR and so on. Rewrite those so that in their implementation, unknown to the user, it can also raise events, and we can start to uh, wean people off of the throw random stuff to common error, expecting it to go to variety of messages, and instead. Um, put in a, a structured event to go to our event log and, and just put out diagnoses rather than trash. But if they don't, uh, and they just use common error, we can at least also get that to go to our, to our log and apply you know, usual sort of algorithms to it. And then the last point, uh, for those who haven't already noticed, the diagnosis algorithms I've mentioned so far are really done. I mean, they're really just counting events or saying one event is bad. Um, those sorts of things, or having a diagnosed in SMF and simply reflecting it here. Um, there's all sorts of research on doing proper software diagnosis algorithms, uh, stack analysis and heuristics and so on. Google have got some stuff on that, and our new master Doracle have got some stuff on that, I believe. Um, and um, it's because Oracle's always done trace, Oracle traces, which I remember fondly. Um, so, the uh, uh, software diagnosis algorithms, you know, real ones, but to, to implement those, you know, need some data. And the idea is, with this, we start to enrich the data pool, and then we can start to experiment and see what works and what doesn't, and what we need to be in that, in that telemetry to work. And final slide, James. Um, beyond Solaris O and um, you know, OSM networking, we can drive some adoption there if, if we're. If we're um, you know, socialize it and make it simple enough to use it, it's not more trouble than it's worth. Um, so we can do that. Um, we do have a, a port of, um, of the whole FMA infrastructure to Linux. It, it runs on our FMSP, which is a Linux, embarrassingly, um, service processor. Um, so all the libNV pair, the whole works, event channels and everything, it's, it's all ported to Linux for, for that product, I believe. Uh, I'm not part of that. Um, potentially we can, you know, um, look at Pushing, pushing that out and you know, making it more general. In which case, you know, we can take off all these Solaris uh, trimmings here because the whole idea is obviously very generic and I, and I think generally quite useful if you could standardize some, some debug APIs and infrastructure. And ideally, it would be nice to, you know, and if you want it to be truly um, successful, you'd, you'd want applications to start using like you know, Apache, for instance, might send, send some things that way. But that's never going to happen as long as it's Solaris only alone. So that, that's the biggest challenge. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.